Welcome to our third Wild Science webinar, uh, a recurring series where our staff gets a chance to share some of their research. Uh, we've had some great presentations thus far, and we've got another great one today. We're going to have Paul Port from the Fisheries Division talking about his research on smallmouth bass on Crooked Creek, and then Luke Naylor. Our waterfowl program coordinator will be uh, sharing some information about uh, distribution and abundance of ducks in the Mississippi alluvial valley of Arkansas. So uh, those of you who know me know that these are two of my favorite subjects to talk about. So I'm very excited about uh, about today's research and have had an opportunity to to tag along with uh, with with both of these guys as, as they've been uh, conducting this research in the past. So I think uh, with, uh, without any further ado, we'll get things started. I think Paul is going to kick things off, off for us today. Uh, Paul is the Game and Fish Commission's District 2 Fisheries Management Biologist and works out of our Mountain Home office. He's been with the agency for a little over 13 years. Paul grew up in northeastern Iowa and received a bachelor's degree in animal ecology from Iowa State University, go Cyclones. He spent uh, college summers as an intern with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, working in fisheries management, uh, fisheries research, and at uh, state fish hatcheries there in Iowa. And after graduation, he went to work with the Illinois Natural History Survey for a couple of years before coming down to Arkansas and enrolling at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, where he earned a master's of science in fisheries management. And Paul joined the Game and Fish Commission in 2008 as a biologist in our trout management program before moving into the warm water fisheries in 2014 when he was hired for his current position as fisheries man management biologist on Bull Shoals and North Fork Lakes, as well as the Buffalo River and Crooked Creek. Uh, Paul, take it away. All right, let's see if I can get this going here. <laughs> You see that? Not yet, but sometimes there's a slight delay. Don't have anything yet, Paul. All right, hold on. There we go. Paul, it's still in the in the uh, the the notes there. Oh, yeah, we got yeah, it. There you, slow, so. there you go. That work? Yep, we got it, man. Well, right. yeah, there we go. Now you're on. Okay. All right. Like Trey said, my name is Paul Port, and I'm going to be telling you about some of the research we've been doing on Crooked Creek in northern Arkansas to address some of angler concerns that have, ri have risen and uh, to gather information to help better manage the smallmouth bass fishery. There are 90,000 miles of streams in Arkansas and smallmouth bass are limited to about half of the counties in Arkansas. Uh, during a 20, 000, 2018 Arkansas license holder survey, this indicated that about 36% of anglers uh, were targeting black bass in general. And then a 2018 statewide survey of resident black bass anglers found that bass anglers spent an average of five days per year angling on small streams. Uh, smallmouth bass in Arkansas are found in the Ozarks and watch the Highlands as well. Arkansas is the center for known smallmouth bass genetic diversity and is home to three unique lineages of smallmouth bass. The northern smallmouth bass are widely distributed around the United States and be found in the Ozark region and streams within the White River Basin. The Neosho strain are only found in the Ozark Washita Interior Highlands and can be found in the Ozark region of Arkansas and streams in, in the Arkansas River drainage. The Wachita smallmouth bass are localized to Arkansas and Oklahoma and found in Wachita mountain range. There are areas of hybridization within these regions, likely as a result of past stockings, movement of fish by anglers, and also natural movements of fish. Um, smallmouth are also a species of conservation interest. Um, Arkansas is the southern range of the smallmouth bass habitat, and uh, some 
concerns of, of stream channel degradation as far as like bank erosion. I've also uh, become concerns in some of our smallmouth bass streams. And also there's been a real big interest in smallmouth bass uh, among anglers and there's been some smallmouth bass focus organizations such as the Ozark, Ozark Smallmouth Bass Alliance uh, pop up and really take an interest in conserving, the, conserving these fish and getting the, our smallmouth bass streams to be really good uh, fisheries. Now our study area is Crooked Creek and it's a nationally known stream and extremely well known to Arkansans for its smallmouth bass fishing. It's consistently recognized in many statewide publications and has been on uh, national fishing publications as well, such as Philbin Stream. It's in uh, north central Ar Arkansas in the Ozarks and is mainly found in Boone and Marion counties and originates south of Harrison and flows 89 miles to the White River. The upper section is uh, relatively limited in its access and its public access. And then the lower section at times of years when it's dry, like July through October, a lot of times the creek will actually flow underground. So we focused on the middle 22 miles of creek, and this is where the most uh, game and fish access points are and the most popular areas. And there's actually five access sites in this section, uh, the Piad access, the snow access, the new Mark Oliver George's Creek access, Kelly Slab at the Fred Berry Education Conservation Center and uh, the Yellville City Access. In the 1980s and 90s, uh, there was gravel mining on the creek and also anglers were starting to have concerns of high harvest. So um, Game and Fish started conducting population samples out there to get a better, better handle on the fishery and also also did a creel survey uh, that spanned five years from 1989 um, to 94 and um, to try to address these concerns. In 1992, the stream was designated as a blue ribbon stream, which was given to it because of its high productivity and uh, the faster growth of smallmouth bass compared to other streams. And Crooked Creek and the Buffalo River are only streams in Arkansas with this designation. This designation um, increased or decreased the daily limit from six fish a day down to two fish a day and increased the uh, minimum length limits that you could keep from 10 fish uh, prior to 14 inches currently. In 1993 as well, uh, there was a ban on gravel mining that took place uh, in our stream, so that uh, helped the fishery as well. In 2001, there was also a catch and release area established along the boundary of the Fred Berry Edu Education Center and there was two special regulation areas established on the upper and lower ends of the creek where um, a one fish over 18 inch minimum length was established on both of those areas. In 2016, Game and Fish uh, was looking at a property uh, along the Georges Creek uh, mouth and this uh, was, a, a uh, was purchased by Game and Fish in 2016 and this split a 12 mile section of creek uh, down to a five mile section and seven mile section, which made those uh, made it from a long one day or a two day float into very manageable one day floats. Um, the access was uh, dedicated in 2017 and was a showcase access with pavement all the way down to the creek, boat ramp, canoe launch, picnic areas, and ample parking. It also opened up a uh, better way opportunities in, in this section. In um, June of 2018, during free fishing weekend, there was some fly fishing uh, courses for smallmouth bass, and during their course, they counted over 50 kayaks floating through the area there trying to teach their class and um, uh, weren't able to catch any smallmouth. So they were very concerned about the fishing pressure that was being um, on the creek and also the number of smallmouth. They equated the number of boats out there to higher harvest and uh, hurting the smallmouth bass fishery. So this prompted us to start, uh, you know, trying to address some of these concerns and questions by doing a creel survey in 2019 and uh, looking at uh, exploitation, the amount of fish harvested through a tagging study. And during the same time in 2019, the Kings River uh, biologists over the Kings River were conducting a creel survey over there, so it'll be, so 
So it was interesting to compare our um, data to what they were finding in that section of the world too, just uh, west of us. So in general, what a Creel survey is, is uh, a way for, to provide managers with information on recreational fishing for any given body of water. These surveys provide managers with estimates of angling effort or the number of hours of fishing per mile. And this is done through angler counts. And the counts can be duck conducted through trail cameras, uh, counting trailers at the access sites, or even aerial flights using airplanes or helicopters. The Creel survey can also provide information um, about anglers catch and harvest. So when you're actually interviewing people, you can see what they caught during their trip and what they've kept and released. And um, we can also get information about uh, what fishing methods they're using to fish the creek, uh, what they're targeting, uh, trip expenditures, and other demographics is like where they have come from to come fish the creek. So what we found are, uh, for the Crooked Creek survey, we had uh, several questions we wanted to answer. First, we wanted to know how much angling effort was occurring in the spring and summer on Crooked Creek. And we focused on these two seasons because a year prior to the survey, we hung uh, cameras at the access sites and counted uh, how many people were floating the creek throughout the whole year and determined by far the most usage was taking place in the spring and summer months. So that's when we focused our time for the Creel survey. Um, we ended up using the cameras, uh, they worked well during the pre-survey, so we ended up using those during the actual Creel survey as well. And the cameras would take a picture um, at the access sites every 10 seconds during daylight hours. And then we went back and counted all those pictures and the anglers and people that were putting in and taking off um, at our access sites and counted all those. Uh, we counted every uh, weekday, every other weekday, and then every weekend and holiday. So it was a lot of pictures, millions of pictures that we went through. Um, took a lot of time, but uh, very good information. Secondly, we wanted to uh, in know whether the new access that the Mark Oliver George's Creek access uh, was increasing angler effort on Crooked Creek. And uh, currently working up, reworking up the old 1980s and 90s creel survey to kind of get a uh, see how the change how much change there has been in fishing effort since the 80s and 90s versus today lastly we wanted to see how many smallmouth bass were being harvested in the spring and summer how many fish people were actually taking home with them <clears throat> we were receiving reports from anglers from concerned anglers that fish were being over harvested and so we wanted to really get uh, some information on this to do this, we conducted 10 six-hour creel days per month for the six-month uh, creel season. We worked uh, weekdays and weekends and holidays because we wanted to be out there when people were out there fishing. And so um, we, we uh, conducted interviews to get a uh, grasp at that. What we found was, um, well, anglers had the assumption that uh, all these kayaks and canoes, the increase in kayak canoes, well, called the uh, kayak revolution a lot of the big box stores sell um, you know very affordable kayaks now and very accessible to the public so a lot of people are taking advantage of that and using our stream when they uh, a lot of our anglers are equating the number of kayaks out there to um, increased fishing pressure and when in their mind equating that to increased harvest and that wasn't necessarily the case um, Crooked Creek did have high angling effort for the size stream that it was, for sure. Um, on Crooked Creek, we uh, estimated 930 hours per mile of angling effort, and in comparison, uh, the Kings River saw 320 hours per mile, so almost almost three times as much on Crooked Creek as what they saw on uh, the Kings River. Um, it was interesting to note that uh, of the, all the kayaks that we counted, only 27% of kayakers out there were actually fishing. So only about a quarter of the people kayaking were uh, actually at a pole and were fishing out there during their, uh, their trip. Um, we also wanted to see if the Mark Oliver uh, George's Creek access was having excessive pressure. And um, what we saw was um, it was second highest pressure to what was taking place at Kelly Slab. So it did have high pressure, but you know, that was one of the reasons we put it in for people to, to use it. 
Um, and it did split up a long stretch of creek into do manageable floats and uh, people were utilizing it, but it wasn't excessive. It was only the uh, second highest uh, behind the Kelly slab access. Um, also, anglers experienced very high catch rates of smallmouth bass. Uh, angler could expect to catch 1.13 smallmouth bass per hour during their trip. And anything over one fish per hour is considered a pretty high catch rates. In comparison, on the Buffalo River, when they did their clear survey, they saw about a half a fish per hour catch rates. And um, it was similar to what they saw during the Kings River study. At uh, They had 0.94 fish per hour. So uh, Crooked Creek had uh, high catch rates of smallmouth bass. During our krill survey, we estimated that 22,488 smallmouth were caught during that six months, and we didn't run into a single kept fish uh, during all of our interviews. So we didn't see a single fish on a stringer or in a cooler or anything. Um, so that leads us to me leads us to believe that uh, harvest is is pretty minimal on the creek. Um, we we noticed that 65% uh, of anglers out there were fishing specifically for smallmouth bass, and um, another 5% were fishing for bass in general because there are some largemouth and a uh, few spotted bass on the creek. And so about 70% were targeting bass of some sort out there. 59% um, of anglers were using artificial lures, and 45% were using soft plastics. So that's by far the most popular way people were fishing. Um, fly, Fly fishing made up about 8% of the anglers, and bait fishing made up about 19% of the anglers. And the rest used a combination of, of, the, of those. Anglers on average spent $60 per trip for their fishing trip and spent nearly $300,000 during the six-month creel survey. Anglers represented 11 different states, too. So when we were interviewing people, we, we talked to people from 11 different states. So people are traveling. Uh, either to come fish the creek or are fishing it while they're here traveling for other reasons. So people uh, are utilizing it for sure. We wanted to uh, get a better handle on tag uh, exploitation or harvest. So we did a tagging study in conjunction with this creel survey. And uh, exploitation studies are um, a good way for us to get an idea of harvest because we don't have to be out there. Um, the tags are on the fish and people report them whether we're out there or not. So to do this, we electrofished that 22 mile section of creek twice and we were able to collect and tag 195 smallmouth bass that were of legal size for people to keep. So we stuck tags in those uh, 195 fish and half of those tags were $100 high reward tags. And we uh, put the $100 tags in, and it actually said $100 on the tag so that people knew that fish was worth $100 and that we thought that was a big enough number that people would report it if they saw it. So we were expecting, uh, you know, about 100% reporting rates of those $100 fish. The other half was given a $10 uh, reward tag, but it didn't say $10 on it. It just said reward, so people had to call in to see how much that fish was worth. And we had very good reporting rates of both. Uh, low tags and high tags. We also double tagged a batch, about a quarter of the fish were uh, double tagged, and this was to help us estimate tag loss. So if a fish was caught, uh, we knew we'd double tag that fish, um, and it was reported with having one tag. We knew it had lost a tag at one point, and we could extrapolate that out um, to um, know how many fish had lost tags throughout the study. We also did a, mort a tagging mortality study to see how many fish died because of tagging and uh, we didn't have any fish die um, after keeping them held in a, a tank um, during our uh, study from the tagging. So uh, the tagging was pretty minimal uh, for fish. Yeah, it, it was good. They didn't affect their health. Um, we also heavily advertised the study so that people knew what to do when they caught a tag. Uh, we put it in the local newspaper. It was on the Arkansas Wildlife on our AGST Facebook page. We put these flyers up at the access points and at local tackle shops and fly shops. And um, uh, really tried to get the word out so people would know what to do. When people did call in a tag, we'd ask them a series of questions, whether or not they kept or released the fish, what time of day they caught the fish to try to get an idea of how much night fishing was taking place. Uh, where the angler came from uh, to fish, 
what type of lures they were using, and also uh, where they had caught the fish. Um, this kind of gives us an idea of fish movement because we know where we, we took GPS coordinates where we released each fish. And then if the angler could give us in the general idea where he caught it, we could kind of get an idea of movement. Um, so from the tagging study, about 45% of our tags were caught after the one year study period was up. So 87 out of the 195 fish. And only five of those fish were reported as being kept. So there is some harvest on the creek, but uh, very minimal. Um, and of those five fish, one of those fish, the angler said that it, his son had fought it to exhaustion in the heat of the summer and he didn't think it was going to make it and he hated releasing the dead fish back into the, in the creek and he never keeps smallmouth bass. And another angler said that it was a trophy and she wanted to uh, mount it and release his fish 90% of the time. So very minimal harvest on the creek. Um, after taking into account tag loss and uh, reporting rates, our exploitation was estimated at 3%. To give you an idea what this means, uh, similar smallmouth bass studies have taken place in Missouri where they saw upwards of 20% or more harvest on their smallmouth bass streams. And crappie exploitation studies will have 40 to 80% exploitation for crappie. So a 3% exploitation rate is, uh, is low. Um, also to further um, reiterate this, uh, it was seen on Buffalo River that smallmouth bass harvest was low as well, where less than 1% of the fish on Buffalo River were reported as kept. And they saw very low harvest on the Kings River during their creel survey as well. We were able to uh, reiterate that uh, soft, plastics, soft plastic lures were indeed the most uh, uh, used type of bait on the creek. And anglers from seven different states reported uh, having caught a tag as far as away as Ohio. So people were, um, you know, people are coming to fish from all over the place. Um, the movement, trout move, or smallmouth bass movement, the most fish stayed pretty much where they were released at um, and moved about uh, 0.2 miles in a downstream direction on average. But for the most part, stayed right where um, they were released. We had a couple had some major movements of um, 17 miles downstream, and we had a couple move upstream up to nine miles. But for the most part, they stayed where we put them, where we released them back in the, the uh, water. So in conclusion, uh, yes, there's very uh, there's high angling pressure on uh, on the creek, and um, but you know, like we said, there's a lot of usage too, and only 27% of those kayaks are um, ang actually angling. Um, we attribute a lot of the um, kayak pressure out there to be from the um, you know availability of least expensive kayaks from big box stores. And also um, Crooked Creek has a water trail that was established in 2012 that Game of Fish promotes um, for floating. And, and there's online maps detailing the creek, what they might find out there. There's also signage at the uh, creek access sites. And a lot of people are just out there enjoying the, the river floating and, and use, utilizing the, the, the kayaks. Um, anglers had very high success, uh, high catch rates on the creek of 1.13 smallmouth bass per hour. Um, to kind of tell you also, um, during the Bull Shoals uh, Lake Creel Survey, black, ang black bass anglers uh, reported catching 0.3 uh, bass per hour during that creel survey, and on Norfolk it was 0.86. So uh, people are catching a lot of fish out there. And we also saw fish were kept being caught multiple times. Um, several of our anglers released their fish with their tags still in place and reported them to us. And then those fish were caught a second time. Some of those fish were caught a second time or even a third time um, on one fish. So fish are being caught multiple times and catch and release um, is prevalent. Um, so one thing we might look at in the future is uh, release mortality, you know, what's the effect of these fish being caught and released multiple times, and also um, looking at the effects of hooking mortality or you know, different bait types, what, what kind of uh, mortality those uh, have, effects those have on mortality of smallmouth. Um, so we saw but from both the 
creel survey and exploitation study, the tagging study, that there's very minimal harvest on on uh, the creek, which uh, we can take to our anglers to address some of their concerns. Um, so anglers have a uh, very high catch and release, re release ethic on, on streams, just like they do on uh, lakes. So you, you know, people just aren't keeping bass that, that often. It's kind of what we're seeing as a trend. So for future management plans, uh, we're, we're doing work in the middle of starting a Crooked Creek management plan. Well, we'll we, a lot of the uh, trail survey people that we interviewed, we got email address from them. So we'll get stakeholder input once we identify uh, some of our plans and goals for Crooked Creek. And we'll get input from people to see what they have for their attitudes and expectations for the creek. We'll be able to speak to a lot of questions from our research and population samples that's, that we've been doing. Um, so we're in the, the midst of uh, working on that Crooked Creek management plan. There's also a statewide stream management plan that encompasses all the smallmouth bass streams in the state. And we um, take objectives and action items with set dates, looking at uh, ways that we can better manage smallmouth bass statewide um, and their habitat and the people that use them. Um, to make sure that uh, fishing and the fisheries stay healthy and good. We also uh, potentially take this data and look into doing a peer-reviewed publication, um, you know, maybe looking at the paradigm shift away from back blast, back black bass harvest on uh, creeks, kind of like similar to what we're seeing on reservoirs. So um, taking this information and comparing it with maybe other states and other water bodies and compiling that. So uh, that, that's, that's all I have and would be willing to take some questions. All right. Thank you, Paul. Does uh, anybody have any questions? I know there's one in the comment section, but anybody want to want to throw one out uh, live here before we go to that one? All right. Let me, I think it was, uh, uh, Matt Schrader has a question. Do you feel that too much public access could potentially negatively impact smallmouth bass and other creek fisheries? And a follow-up is what was the estimated catch and release mortality of smallmouth bass that were caught and reported? So we, uh, I mean, yeah, too much access could definitely be an issue. Um, but, um, you know, just, Anecdotally, from that uh, class that was the fly fishing class that had 50 kayaks float over the top of the hole that they were trying to fish, you know, those fish are going to probably hunker down and not be biting as readily with that much uh, canoe, canoe and kayak pressure floating over them during the day. So it may uh, negatively in impact uh, the smallmouth bass fishery, but at the same time, um, with the such low harvest out there. Um, we're not, the fish looked, uh, healthy and, um, lots of good size and numbers of fish out there. Um, so as far as the catch and release mortality on smallmouth bass that were caught and reported, um, we didn't, I mean, the, they just reported the, the tags, um, and we didn't really do, uh, the mortality part of, you know, hooking mortality or, or release mortality portions of this study yet. Hey, uh, Paul, can you, uh, can you hit your in present screen there? We're getting kind of a, a double effect. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, sorry no worries. No worries. Just a reminder. Uh, any other questions about, uh, the Crooked Creek smallmouth study before we move on? All right. Going once, going twice. And going three times. Well, uh, thank you, Paul. I would uh, tack on to the end here. Uh, uh, we did covered uh, Paul a little bit, a portion of Paul's research uh, on the Arkansas Wildlife Television Show. And if you'd like to see a visual representation of kind of what that uh, looks like and uh, you know how they conducted that, it's it's pretty cool. There's some really neat drone shots of the guys going down through uh, the creek with an electric fishing boat. And you, uh, if you're a smallmouth angler, you will see just how deeply those fish will bury themselves under uh, under ledges and what have you down there. But it, it, it's very cool. Uh, thank you, Paul. Really appreciate you.
All right, the next, uh, the second half of today's Wild Science webinar will be by Luke Naylor, who's going to talk about uh, distribution and abundance of ducks in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley. Luke is, of course, the Game and Fish Commission Waterfowl Program Coordinator. He attended Kansas State University and received a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife and Fisheries Biology. Uh, while attending K-State, he worked as a seasonal aide for Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks and spent a summer in Manitoba working as a research assistant for Delta Waterfowl. Uh, Luke went on to earn his Master's of Science in Conservation Ecology at the University of California, Davis in 2002, where he studied management of wintering waterfowl habitats. After completing his uh, degree work there for his master's, uh, Luke worked with the uh, U.S. Geological Survey and with the California Waterfowl Association, as well as Ducks Unlimited, delivering private lands and wetland management programs for the California Department of Fish and Game. He's been the Game and Fish Commission's Waterfowl Program Coordinator since 2006. Luke, take it away. Thank you, Trey. I didn't know we were going to have a, an Iowa State Cyclone presenting um, ahead of me here. That's the basketball game about to happen in a couple of days is coined Farmageddon between Iowa State and Kansas State University. They coin those uh, athletic meetings as Farmageddon these days, but given the status of both those teams right now, it's not going to be something you really want to tune into. Well, the, the basketball program that uh, most folks cheer for here in Arkansas is actually having a pretty good year. If, uh, if anybody that's a Cyclone or Purple Cat fan wants to jump on board, Luke. No, I'm good, Trey. You know that. Um, so, so, yeah, I'll get started here. Everything, give me, uh, everything good, Trey? Yeah, looking good. Thank you, Luke. All right, cool. All right, we'll jump right in here. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about duck distribution during the winter here in Arkansas and, and focus primarily on the Mississippi Alluvial Valley uh, for this. Uh, I'd like to uh, research collaborators here are a, a former graduate student at the co-op unit, John Herbert, and uh, Abhishek is uh, all we call him, our statistician, uh, helped us out with this. And then David Crimmins, of course, retired at the co-op unit here a few years ago. Um, they helped with uh, developing this research, of course, uh, doing this research, uh, but none of this is, is actually possible. All the hours upon hours upon hours that the aerial survey observers spent in the aircraft to collect these data. Um, and that's some biologists here. Uh, well, one former, but uh, two current biologists in uh, the Wildlife Management Division, Jason Jackson and Jason Carball, uh, did the lion's share of that work really for, for many, many years now. And then uh, JJ Abernathy has now left us, but uh, collected some of these data as well. So, you know, if you're not aware, uh, Arkansas is, is an area of continental significance. Uh, we operate in the waterfowl world under the uh, North American Waterfowl Management Plan, or NAWAMP, if I refer to that throughout the talk, uh, by its acronym. So, um, you know, this the, the Arkansas in general, and specifically the Mississippi Valley there in the, in the map, are, are the, really the, the hot spots and, and areas of, of very high significance for this continental resource we talk about with, with waterfowl. And, you know, that little <clears throat> grainy newspaper clipping over there is, uh, you know, way, way, way back when, you know, the 40s and 50s, folks recognized this, this kind of funnel phenomenon where ducks leave all, all areas of the breeding grounds and migrate south and really based on geology, right, following river corridors, end up here at the bottom of the funnel in Arkansas. So, uh, you know, Eons and eons has been important uh, for ducks. So, regionally, uh, we know that the MAV intensive agricultural—that's uh, the number one, the number one economic driver over there. And then, with private and public land managers, there's a high and active habitat management for waterfowl. Uh, come, comes along with that is a high level of recreational use. Uh, you see there in the bottom that that's a uh, resident duck stamps. Our, our total duck stamp sales. Here in Arkansas, so we've been been cranking along at over a hundred thousand Arkansas duck stamps sold for several years now. Uh, so the popularity of, of duck hunting and that recreational resource doesn't seem to be waning anytime soon. And with that public interest, a little tongue in cheek here, of course, there's a fair bit of input uh, and interest about duck abundance and distribution patterns uh, in Arkansas, as you might imagine. So. What do we do to keep track of these populations? So for, for many, many years, uh, folks 
conducting something called the Midwinter Waterfowl Survey, the first full week in January since about the late 40s, uh, early 1950s, and, and have collected data uh, in a semi-coordinated fashion over all that time. But, but the limitation is, is that the methods used to collect uh, duck and, and goose, the waterfowl abundance information is just not been that great, frankly. Uh, surveys is essentially when someone gets up in an airplane and they, they cruise around. They look uh, for likely waterfowl habitat. Uh, they kind of get up in the air, see what's flooded, uh, look to areas of known concentrations historically. Not any real, uh, typically, not any real formal structure to those surveys. So there's not a lot you can do um, analytically with, the, with those data. So there have been some previous work that I'll come back to here at the very end of a former researcher with USGS out of Mississippi who, who designed uh, formal statistically valid transect base for all of the Mississippi Louisville Valley uh, with all six states in, involved in that and including Arkansas here. And, and so we started off onto this uh, collecting actually what I consider uh, very strong, very um, scientifically defensible data on duck uh, abundance and distribution, starting with our November 2009 survey. So we've got over a over a decade period of record now for that. These just real briefly, there could be a whole nother presentation on these these methods, but but real briefly, um, if you kind of look in the the left image there, you know you'll see these lines, these these transects that a observer flies, and you know, traditionally those cruise surveys might have uh, might have counted those clumps of ducks circled there in that image and really not paid any attention to all the ducks in between those clumps. Uh, with a formal sampling method is this in this airplane cartoon there kind of shows exactly what happens. An observer sits in the airplane and they do some marking on the on the window and the stretch of the aircraft that then gives them a 250 meter wide sampling strip on the ground. Uh, flying at, of course, a known altitude. And you can see there on the right, that's, uh, that's probably Jason Jackson look, looking at uh, an aerial survey uh, transect map uh, navigating where to go next. So real formal data collection now. Uh, for the, and that, those are the data that we'll use um, in, this, in this analysis I'll, I'll be discussing here. So, you know, back, I mentioned the early work uh, with, with formal surveys in the Delta, and they're really, for Arkansas, there are five uh, expert opinion-based strata. You know, we came along in in 2009 and 10, started working on this pretty, again, with a co-op unit uh, with David Kremens and a postdoc up there working pretty intensively to, to read, to stratify that. So now we have kind of, um, you know, more biologically or, or geologically, I guess, uh, based strata. So we, we developed 11 delta based on watersheds. And again, that's a discussion about exactly how we did that but just for this presentation you'll see in that map those are the those are the strata we use uh, that follow these primary um, what we think as they are watersheds but probably represent significant habitat uh, blocks within the delta and we randomly select transects throughout these uh, strata each survey and, and this map there shows what just one example of what one individual survey might look like so you see Fairly extensive coverage there. We're flying somewhere between, uh, I think, four to 5,000 kilometers that those observers are, are sitting in the airplane with a pilot uh, counting ducks along these transects. So, you know, we've been able to use this over several years now to, to really do a lot of public information work, which is fantastic. You know, we can look, um, for example, that the top line there is, is within one season, just this past uh, wintering period for actually. So you look at December of 2020, moving on to the, the midwinter survey, the first week of January 2021, and on into the last week of January. We can do this, do this uh, simple work in GIS to kind of crank out where these hot spots are, if you will. And it's just relative concentration of ducks, not absolute numbers, but kind of showing where these ducks are, are distributing themselves uh, within a season. And then on the bottom, we can look, uh, for example, what you might find across three different midwinter, the most recent three midwinter periods and how that distribution varies uh, during the same sampling time frame, but across different wintering periods based on lots of things that we're going to talk about here through the rest of the presentation. So, you know, just what it amounts to is, is now after starting this in, in 09, uh, we really came upon a pretty substantial data set uh, that 
really doesn't exist many other places. Louisiana has a similar data set much longer, actually, uh, from the 60s maybe for coastal Louisiana. And, and Texas has a transect-based formal sampling scheme they use for the midwinter. They've been doing for probably 30 years now. Uh, but outside that, there's not many other data sets like this available uh, collected by state agencies. So what we wanted to do is really kind of move beyond this kind of colorful maps, frankly, that we share with the public, which are awesome. And they're a great information tool, but they don't tell us what's really driving uh, those hot spots. Uh, we kind of have to infer that and, and get information from observers about what we're actually they see when they fly to say, okay, what might be driving the spots in those maps uh, we produce each month. Uh, but but we wanted to move beyond that to actually trying to trying to grow our understanding of what's driving duck abundance, distribution, habitat use in the delta throughout time. And it's kind of amazing really to to, to look back and think that the, the mallard is arguably studied uh, wildlife um, in the world. I mean, ducks have more research done on them than about any other taxa, waterfowl in general, really, but the ducks for sure. And but no, don't know for sure in the primary wintering area for mallards in North America, we, we there's never been research done to show exactly what the abundance and distribution of those birds. So, more formally here, we could create these distribution models to see how duck abundance, uh, how they, how these populations fluctuate within and among years, look at these habitat associations. And, and John Herbert here on it, in his master's project uh, started with mallards, but did was able to have time to move beyond to uh, actually include all dabbling ducks, at least in surveys as well. So what we did is establish, uh, you know, a few covariates that we think are, are important for duck distribution. We had 25 aerial surveys to pull from, uh, those conducted, of course, November, December, and then a couple of them in January. And, and we, you know, you can get a lot of data from the USDA cropland data layer that's updated every year to show what kind of ag was on the landscape. That's that bottom right image if you're not familiar with that. So you can look at an entire area and at a very pretty precise level, figure out what kind of um, land cover was there, or at least how it relates to ag. Uh, there's some work been done several years ago on this WSI, this Winter Severity Index, uh, that really hadn't been tested on it with a data set like this. Uh, that kind of models uh, a few factors thought to influence duck migration. So we included that in the models along with managed lands. So those are state or federal managed lands. And the next biggest block of, of what land we might call in the, in the conservation protected lands is the wetland reserve program lands. And really importantly, you'll find out here in a minute that modeling surface is no small task, but it, it turns out to be critically important in, in any kind of these studies and, and trying to figure out what's going on uh, with, with ducks, uh, where they are and why they're there. So in GIS, right, we just move these things from, um, you can classify surface water from uh, publicly available Landsat, Landsat images. There's a lot of folks now after, after this work's being completed who are I think they can do that every year, of course, it gets quicker and quicker, you're able to do this. So stack these layers essentially on top of one another and uh, split, the, split the entire MAV into two by two uh, kilometer cells and assign a, a land cover type, a WSI value uh, and food availability uh, that ties back to the known uh, or assumed food value in each land cover type and then surface water. You basically, if you're familiar with this kind of work, you just kind of stack all these different layers on top of one another. As you might see in, in this image here, you can, you can look and assign a zero to one for each covariate, right? So this inset map shows what classified surface water would look like. Then you add land cover on top of it. So you know, okay, it was this land cover type and it was also flooded during the time frame of this survey, which is really important because we are talking about waterfowl, right? So uh, if it's not flooded at the time of the survey, we, that doesn't obviously have a lot of foraging value for ducks. Um, I'll just back up here real quick. The category, so the response variables here, yeah, we, the observers go through and count actual numbers of ducks. So they, they, they give a, an estimate of the number of ducks um, that they see during each survey. Uh, but to simplify the process, we kind of looked and the, the, kind of the natural breaks for those counts fell at 1 to 15, 16 to 100, or a flock size of over 100 ducks. And 
you might be surprised that most of the observations are one to 15 to 16 to 100 ducks. There really aren't that many observations of 100 plus ducks given the methods we use just counting a single transect. All right, so it's a two stage model and this will about end the statistical conversation, but essentially it's real important to keep in mind that there, with the two stages of this, uh, we modeled was a duck, what was the likelihood that a duck was observed in that cell? And the second stage that was conditional on a duck being present. So if a duck was present in that cell, what category, what number, what count was likely to occur within that same cell? Two stage uh, process here. So, so then all this happened. Um, if you got questions about that, um, don't ask them. I can't answer them. Uh, but there's a lot of math behind the scenes. And a short amount of time spent here as well, just cell selection uh, procedures out there these days. And in these cases, it, it turned out that uh, for dabblers, that model was just slightly better because it had a few less parameters in it and had a pretty similar um, fit. Uh, but for Mallers, the, the full model of all main effects was the most uh, descriptive model. So as I move forward, the, the results I'm showing are going to use the habitat model for dabblers and, and the full model for Mallers and, and all the results I'm going to show here moving forward. So, yeah, so this is a, just another colorful model, you might think, but, but it actually gets us a lot finer detail by, if you can look closely there, um, you, can, you can pick up that, that two by two uh, kilometer grid is starting to show up. And this is within one wintering period of 2011, 2012. And, and we can start to get an idea. <clears throat> the model produces these results where we can look at, okay, within each of those cells, uh, what was the probability of dabbler presence within each of those? So when we look at, uh, you can start to see some, some patterns here where the red indicates a higher probability of dabbler. So early in the wintering period, when typically around here, uh, habitat is pretty limited in, in early November. Uh, water is not very uh, abundant across the landscape because we really haven't hit the rainy season in, in full swing. That changes throughout December and early January. See some shift in dabbler presence there, uh, particularly in late January 2012 with the vast majority, the, the highest uh, probability of dabblers being present was in the far south portion of the delta. So the point here being is that these, these surfaces, these probability surfaces were generated for every, all 25 surveys conducted uh, for dabblers and mallards. And if you look at probability, probability surfaces for dabbler abundance, you got to kind of hone your eyes in a little bit. Um, on the size of these images, but the, the same wintering period here, you look at November of 2011, and if I walk through the categories, you'll see that top left in each of these images is category zero. So that's basically, there were no ducks. Uh, and you can see as you walk through, category one would be the probability that that cell um, had a count of one to 15 duck dabblers. And then on again to category two, which is 16 to 100, Category three, 100 plus. So category would be, would indicate if you see any warmer colors, which in this sense are those colors that are showing up as, as more of a lighter blue, moving on into yellow, and then occasionally red, uh, you see that the probability of, of a flock of 100 or more dabblers was really most common in the North Delta, um, west of Crowley's Ridge in November of 2011. The vast majority of the delta had the probability um, was high. You see a lot of red for zero dabblers being zero dabbler abundance across most of the delta. Uh, you know, move on to December, you see that shift a little bit. You see those hot spots kind of change. So the point is not to really um, dwell on any one particular survey uh, map that's produced, just really shown as examples that then help inform you know, each one of these surface probability surfaces and shows us, allows us to determine, okay, what, what was in each of those cells? Why were there dabblers present? And why was there greater abundance in certain cells by doing this for all 25 surveys, which we had data. So what, what were the end, end results? So really this, this table kind of sums up 
um, you know, the primary um, factors uh, driving duck, uh, dabbler, and mallard abundance and distribution in the Arkansas MAV. You know, I always get down, you, you kind of break all this stuff down and, and uh, thousands, of, tens of thousands of, of miles of surveys flown and lots of analytical work, and it really kind of all boils down to, to one table uh, showing you what's important out there. Uh, but if you walk through this, I've kind of highlighted in green, there were 20 out of 25 or, um, of the surveys indicated that this factor had a positive or negative, mostly positive influence on dabblers, for example. So let's, you can take a look at dabbler presence, uh, open water in 24 out of 25 surveys, open water had a positive influence, positive, it positively predicted dabbler, uh, dabbler presence across the gate. But open water didn't have much of an influence on dabbler abundance. Uh, you got to jump back up in the in the table. Far and away, rice fields and the availability of surface water what dabbler abundance. And if you move across to mallards, you see some similar results, uh, not, although you know less of a connection with say soybean fields and open water to to a lesser degree. But it's very strong connection dabbler presence predicted by the availability of rice fields and surface water and a very strong connection to, to mallard abundance with with surface water in, primarily in rice fields as well kind of walk through that whole table there and see all these other factors that you know we thought and and you might hear about people talking about as, as very important ducks you know yeah we, we see a lot of ducks on these areas um, we know that weather influences duck presence or abundance. Well, when we looked at weather severity index, you see for dabbler presence, there was a you know 17 out of 25 surveys, WSI had a negative effect on dabbler presence. That only happened 12 out of 25 for mallards. What we think that is, is it is kind of indicating that dabblers are a little bit more sensitive to colder temperatures, to, to higher WSI values that would drive them out of, of certain cells where mallards are a little more hardy and can stick around a little bit longer, so saw less of an impact of high WSI values uh, moving them out of those cells. I had to throw this in there. Uh, you hear a lot of questions about cornfields and, and how no duck could survive uh, its, its life without eating corn. Um, well, you can see the impact had on dabbler and mallard presence and abundance during 25 surveys that we flew. Um, not very strong by all accounts. Now, to be fair, there's not that many cornfields on the landscape, and if they're not, doesn't have great coverage, then they don't have as high a probability of, of, of influence the results. But I think it's pretty, pretty interesting to point out that there's basically no effect, uh, positive effect or negative on or mallards in the MAV from, from the availability of cornfields. So another way to, to slice this is, kind of do this calculation of how how often a covariate was most important during a survey. So this one shows whether how many out of 25 surveys a factor had a positive or negative impact on presence or abundance. This table indicates how each factor was the most important out of all factors. If you take a look at that again, the clear winners in this are, are rice fields in combination with surface water availability. Um, even stronger um, influence, you would say, for mallard abundance is, is really seems to be driven by surface water availability. So if you look at this visually, again, just one example survey. And you can look how some of these covariates impact mallard abundance. So if you look at the, the image of classified surface water there in the top right, uh, you can see the, the all blue in the surface water was present. And if you go over to the left, you start to see these category one, two, and three, some, some yellow and red spots that kind of line up uh, where that surface water is, which if you're familiar with that region, uh, that's the Big Ditch Club region throughout Stuttgart. Uh, Biomeda WMA, uh, the Grand Prairie, the southern portion of the Grand Prairie uh, near Stuttgart, uh, some very popular areas uh, with lots of managed lands and, and in this case lots of uh, a fair bit of surface water uh, from natural flooding. WSI, similar impact, right? If you look at that, it's kind of counterintuitive. The red, the hotter colors in this WI map actually indicate 
colder conditions and the blue or cooler colors indicate warmer conditions. So you can see that really the combination of surface water availability and their conditions both were, were clumped in that kind of southwest portion of the MAV in this particular survey. Again, this is just one survey out of 25, but it kind of is a nice visual representation of how those different covariates impacted duck abundance, uh, mallard abundance during the survey. Um, finally, with the, with the model images, I think it's really important to consider that, that the, the really holistic way that uh, these researchers um, develop these models, it's, it's really important to consider that you've got to kind of do this model selection procedure and find out what really is, what are the drivers. Because, for example, you know, you know, you might think, and pretty easy to think, that really agriculture on the landscape could have a huge impact on, on where mallards are and how abundant they are in the delta. And that's true, but if we just took um, on the right is a model using only agriculture. So it doesn't take into account surface water, doesn't take into account managed lands, uh, and you get what really is kind of a kind of false results, right? You look at particularly when I see that category two in the top right image, you see kind of that lighter blue color across a broad swath of the MAV, which would indicate that you got a decent probability of, of seeing a, a fair sized flock of ducks in those regions. And, and what reality tells you in the full model on the left is that it's a whole lot more honed in than that. That actual large numbers of ducks are, are much more concentrated than what just looking at agriculture might tell you. So, you know, what do we, what do we find here? Um, and this is important, I keep, anybody who's heard me talk about this or read any of these survey reports um, over the years, uh, I, I just can't beat the drum enough that Duck presence and abundance is really driven by surface water distribution and how much surface water is out there in combination, importantly, with, with the abundance and distribution of rice fields. Mallards use a lot of different habitats, but extensive surface water uh, has to be on the landscape to keep large populations of mallards around. And to fall back on those covariates again, you know, you hear a lot about soybean fields and how important they are to, to waterfowl. A couple of things going on there, which is why I highlight it here. Um, you know, soybean fields are about three times as common in the Delta as rice fields. So, and they do get flooded. Um, and, and so, and they're very open habitat, which leads to a high degree of visibility. So we think that the in, this kind of the signatures of dabbler and mallard use in soybean fields is most likely uh, just their overall ability on the landscape. WSI did have an impact. It's the only study that's kind of looked at this on a, on a regional scale. It did, did reduce dabbler presence, but it had a weaker effect in mallards. Interestingly, that, that when there was a colder, more severe WSI, more severe weather con winter weather conditions, mallards tended to clump a bit more. Uh, which anybody who's been on a landscape, a duck hunter, or just a duck watcher uh, probably sees that happen during those cold spells. And I like this as a, as a public land manager, um, that mallard abundance in December and January in particular, uh, we found it really tied in, uh, really honed in to these bottom of hardwood forest corridors, uh, which are oftentimes in public ownership with some very, very important private land exceptions to that, great private land uh, bottom and hardwood forest out there as well. A lot of mallards and dabblers use these agricultural fields within two to 10 kilometers of managed lands. It's this whole idea that we use in, in duck management of complexes, providing complexes of habitat are what really is important uh, for pro providing all the needs uh, for waterfowl over the wintering period, because it allows these ducks to seek out these resources that change constantly. It's a highly variable landscape. They're kind of anchored by these bottom of the hardwood forests, these publicly owned and privately managed cores uh, of these complexes. And, and we find we see these, these bottom of the hardwood forests typically flood up a lot more through mid-December, through mid-January. That's the story would have flooded and, and ducks seem more drawn to those areas during those times. I think it's really important to note that there's a high probability of absence throughout the Delta, um, indicating that there's a fair bit of the MAV that's not not it doesn't have um, 
it's not without value. It's just it's relatively lower value for mallards. Um, so, you know, moving forward, we're get, we're going to keep doing this this monitoring. Um, uh, continue to build this data set. Um, you know, we we can it allows us now to look back um, and have a data set that allows us to, to have scientifically defensible method to track trends over time and do analyses like this in the future. Uh, for example, here we can look back at the uh, previous work done on this uh, com in the gray compared to our work with this sampling method over the past 10 years plus. And um, spoiler alert, the, the mallard counts in, in the midwinter survey, the last 10 years are dang near identical, if not slightly higher than what they were in the 88, 89, 90 period, and, uh, and including survey in 05. Uh, so ducks are ducks mallards, by the way, are, are still in Arkansas, uh, according to our counts. So finally, um, what management action we can, can we take from this? I think it's really important. We always kind of do this anyway, but this just support for managing these habitat anchor habitat complexes, really these anchors of public and private managed land, and, and really urges us to focus on these priority landscapes. We got to do everything we can to keep surface water in the landscape. Uh, most forces out there these days are are doing what they can to take surface water off the landscape, frankly. Uh, so I think it's important for us to consider that in any kind of management activities we have. We must have surface water available if we want to keep ducks coming to Arkansas. And agricultural land is important over large landscapes. We got to do um, everything we can to keep that agri those agricultural lands um, increase, at least maintain, and, and ideally increase the value of those lands to waterfowl. So that's all I've got, Trey. All right, thank you, Luke. Uh, how about questions? Who's got questions? I, no I noticed there was one that popped into the comment section from, um, I think it was, where'd it go? Dennis, yeah, Dennis Thunderdale uh, asked about, what about uh, green tree reservoirs in, in the cover surveys? Understanding that as far as aerial surveys go, GTRs are, are it's kind of hard to count ducks in the trees, right, Luke? I mean, and how, how does that fit into the to the big picture of cover, I guess, is what Dennis is, is asking. Yeah, yeah, we done some work with that. Fortunately, we have a highly trained observers who are, who are pretty, actually, Pretty darn good at counting, uh, picking up ducks in, in, in the forest. Uh, we actually did some work with, with double observer sampling to look for visibility bias. Uh, kind of figured that it wasn't really worth our, our, our analytical or um, additional time effort to continue that. Uh, but, you know, Dennis, I think part of it is that, um, you know, a lot of those forested landscapes are also the ones that are hunted um, while we're doing these these are all diurnal, diurnal surveys of course we're not flying around in the dark trying to count ducks so we're, we're out there counting the, on the landscape when a lot of these forested wetlands including our public managed lands are being hunted so i think it's where that notion of these these forested corridors kind of providing these um but but we do pick up ducks. we do have observations of ducks in these flooded forests uh for sure so that, it's not impossible Okay, any other questions? Hey, Luke, it's Bobby. A uh, couple of things first. Uh, you know, I mentioned to Chris when he first alerted me you guys were doing this. I, I hope a lot of the state, uh, Trey, continues to plug into this and, and even catches the recordings afterwards. Uh, just listening to you and Paul both this morning, it, just a big reminder of the, the quality and strength we have in our, in our biology work. This question may not be so relevant, but um, I'm just thinking, listening again to these, we're talking principally about ducks and the habitat and largely, again, where there's surface water. water. Over time, has the, you know, the, the migration of geese and whatever levels of, you know, that they come, because they do share uh, food sources to a degree, although geese are obviously going to feed in drier fields more, et cetera. But, does that ever influence any of the the patterns across the, the geography? Yeah, so goose competition is is something that's um, you know front of mind to a lot of these days. Um, there hadn't been a ton of research on it. Um, there was a graduate student who uh, who worked on one of our cooperative positions for a while, uh, Ethan Massey, who did his research at UAM, 
and and did some did some work looking at goose diets down there. Um, and it was mostly kind of South Delta. So, uh, but what they found is yes, white fronted geese are arriving early enough to take advantage. Of kind of their their biology tells them that they want to eat some some grains, so they're eating rice. Uh, but by the time unlike last year, some snow geese got here early, but typically snow geese are coming around during about the time when that green flush starts to hit in the Delta. Yeah. And found as uh, snow geese are primarily feeding on green browse. So now of course we see them in rice fields, but there's green shoots to be had there too. And of course anything sitting, I mean, they're going to eat rice if they can get their bill on it. Um, but yeah, we're, we, we kind of account for geese in a sort of ad hoc way in our, on our energetic models for the Mississippi Flyway to kind of take that into account uh, to make sure we at least have some way to acknowledge that they're probably competing somehow. There have not been many direct studies looking at like how, how geese exclude ducks from feeding in a site, for example, like physically exclude them, just like behaviorally, much less use the same resources. So we're kind of limited on the amount of data we have um, right now, with the exception of that one study. All right, thanks. Good job. Thanks. Look, looks like there's uh, uh, you know kind of more more of a, a staff related question about managing a, a managing a data set like this. So Jeff Quinn says, uh, "What are the major challenges managing this large and, and growing database?" Yeah, that's some question, Jeff. <laughs> we. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, yes, it's challenging. <laughs> so, um, it is not in a database because Jeff, as you know, Excel is not a database. Um, so there is no, there is no database, unfortunately, um, at this point. And I'm sure there's more conversation to be had of that during a different, during a different time. But, um, but yeah, so there's, fortunately, <laughs> be real upfront. I mean, I've got the, the postdoc who worked on this, um, with, with the co-op unit, she works as a bio, uh, biometrician for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of Albuquerque. And she is kind enough to, when we collect the data, and uh, she has built some, uh, done all the programming in, in R, statistical soft you know, package R, um, to crank all this out for me. And so my data management, Jeff, is to send her an email um, with all the outputs, the raw data, and then she cranks it out and, and sends me back the products that we use and and actually Cody Mastery and GIS has gotten up to speed on on doing this as well. So he's also able uh, to generate this stuff. But but uh, it's a without those that help, uh, it would be it was when we first started this, we didn't have those uh, kind of easy buttons. Uh, and and uh, it was quite a, now at least the analysis is quite a bit quicker uh, than what it was. But data housing is, is going to continue to be an issue. Luke, I'll throw out one more question, uh, and since it doesn't appear that there are any more, with with the bright spotlight that's been shown on Arkansas waterfowl hunting, duck hunting over the over the past few years, and the 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 the, the sky is falling kind of mentality or perception, at least it's out there. How how can some of this like maybe inform decisions and, and, and allow us to maybe educate the public a, a little bit better about what really is going on and, and maybe some areas where we do need to be concerned and, and, and others where we don't. Yeah, I think it, it, it kind of puts, um, yeah, finally puts a lot of uh, objectivity on it, right? I mean, it kind of takes us out of it, so collected these data, and now we've done some really formal analyses on the drivers and you know, I think it, it, it kind of speaks to a couple, couple major things that um, with the importance of this highlights of, of rice fields in association with surface wall, I mentioned there at the end, that there's not many efforts um, right now to increase the amount of time that just rain, natural runoff stays on the landscape. I mean, actually, to be blunt, I mean, most efforts these days are doing just the opposite. They want to get water off the landscape as quickly as possible, move it out, um, you know, zero grading a lot of fields, which is fantastic for water conservation during the summer. I'm, all, I'm totally supportive of that. That's what we need to do for groundwater conservation. But I think it begs the conversation of, okay, well, then what do you do in the winter? When you have a landscape now that can move water off at an inch per 24 hours, 
And we now have proof, frankly, that I mean, this surface water that none of us control really is what's driving this. I mean, some you know some small things theoretically, like just just boarding up rice fields. Uh, the whole management of those things is going to be critically important. Maintaining the food value in rice fields, we make a lot of assumptions about what's out there. Um, based on you know our, our program with W Rice program we're working on now, of course you're familiar with, you know, we're trying to make that we actually have food in those rice fields for ducks. Again, given current management pressures that appear to be taking what likely taking a lot of the food value in those rice fields away. So you combine those two things where surface water appears to be getting less common on the landscape, rice fields appear to be becoming less valuable per acre. Those are the most important drivers for mallards in Arkansas. So if you want to worry about ducks long term, let's worry about those things. Um, I'm not too concerned about what Missouri or Kansas or Oklahoma are doing. I'm concerned about what's going on in Arkansas to provide habitat here and keep ducks coming here because they're still coming. Um, but I think that we've got to get just a bit more active on maintaining those, those, uh, those factors that we've shown to be pretty important. Thank you. All right. Uh, before we uh, wrap this thing up, any more questions from anybody? Okay. Well, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks to Paul and Luke for great presentations. And, uh, you know, as we all know, none of this happens uh, with just one person doing the work. So thanks to all of those folks working with y'all as well in the field to uh, collect these data and uh, inform our decisions about wildlife and fisheries management. Uh, thanks everybody. We'll see you uh, next month for the next Wild Science webinar. So long.